Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical engineering at Georgia Tech. 3084 has a class called 2026 as its prerequisite. One thing that's a little strange about the sequence is that 2026 mostly deals with discrete time signals. So we deal with some issues such as sampling much earlier in the EC curriculum at Georgia Tech than most schools do. So the general idea here is that we would take some sort of signal that's continuous time, usually represented as an X of T, and then make a slight abusive notation and evaluate the signal at evenly spaced samples in time that are spaced according to some sampling period, capital TS. And then in a slight abusive notation, we wrote the discrete time versions of the signal using X with brackets here for an integer index N. So our sampling frequency is one over the sample period. And if we wanted, we could express this in terms of a sample frequency in radians per second as two pi FS or two pi over capital T sub S. And actually let me make this S a little bit lower so you don't get the impression that it's two different variables multiplying each other. That S is a subscript. So in 2026, we looked at just sampling sinusoids. And we discovered that if you wanted to reconstruct the sinusoid from its samples, you needed something very particular. You needed to have the sample rate to be strictly bigger than twice whatever the actual frequency of the sinusoid is. And the idea here is that you might have some other sinusoids present, but as long as they're of a lower frequency than whatever the maximum frequency is your signal is, and you sample more than twice that, and technically, it does need to be a strict inequality here. Then if you have the samples, you can reconstruct the original signal just from those samples. And that's a really remarkable result. We also found that if you didn't satisfy this criterion, that you could get an effect called aliasing, where you might try to reconstruct the signal, but you would get the wrong frequencies back. So in 2026, we did that with individual sinusoids or some sinusoids. But now in 3084, with our new Fourier transform material and the ability to write signals as sums of an uncountably infinite number of sinusoids, we can deal with this at a little higher level of sophistication than we could in 2026. So here's a conceptual model for sampling. Suppose we have our signal x of t, and we multiply it by an impulse train. The impulse train will be defined as a sum going from minus infinity to infinity of delta functions, each of them landing at an integer multiple of our sample period. So we'll write this as p of t, and it will look a little something like this. We'll have a series of unit step functions here at 0, ts, 2ts, minus ts, and so on infinitely either direction. So that's what's going in here. So let's call the output here x s of t, and my subscript here s is going to stand for a sampled signal. So let's write this as x s of t is equal to x of t times p of t. And here, let me just plug in the expression for p of t explicitly. So at this point, we can simplify things by pulling the x of t inside of the sum and use our usual simplification trick. So this now looks like x of n capital TS, and this is using our usual simplification trick for Dirac delta functions. So let's think about what this looks like. Suppose that my original signal x of t looks something like this, do 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 do, just a happy function, and then we're multiplying it by this impulse train. So what we wind up with for our sampled signal is a bunch of delta functions with weights of what our original function x of t was. Now, this x sub s of t is not the same as x of n. It's not the same. It's conceptually containing the same information. But x of n really should be thought of as a sequence of numbers in an array inside a computer or something like that. And this x s of t is a conceptual model. It is indeed continuous time. It's got big chunks of zero on a t-axis here. This is a mathematical model to help us think about the sampling process.
This does not correspond to any physical piece of hardware. It doesn't match any chip you might buy from Maxim or analog devices. If you crack open one of those chips, you won't find anything multiplying an input by an impulse train. You won't find anything in the chip making a list of impulses that are these weird, infinitely thin, infinitely tall things. This is just a way to try to get a handle of thinking about what the process is mathematically. Okay, so let's think about what X of S looks like in the Fourier domain. What does big X of S look like? Well, we're multiplying in time, so I know that corresponds to convolving in the frequency domain, but I need to remember to put that little one over two pi out in front for this version of the property. So I have big X of J omega convolved with big P of j omega. So now it's a question of figuring out what is the Fourier transform of this impulse train. What is big P of j omega? Well, if you look at the lecture from a couple of lectures ago, we actually computed what this is for a generic periodic signal, and this is certainly a periodic signal. We said that the Fourier transform was the sum over k, of 2 pi times the Fourier series coefficients of the signal you're taking the transform of. Let me write that as a k times a delta function, omega minus k. And let me write the fundamental period here as 2 pi over capital TS. I've usually written this TS as a T naught, but here I'm writing it with an S to emphasize that this is the sample period. And also, to create some contrast with a similar derivation we're going to do next lecture. So I need to find out what these A of K are. So I'll pull out my Fourier series analysis integral. I have one over the period here, which is TS. I can integrate over any period. I could integrate over this period, or I could integrate over this period. Let me go ahead and integrate over this period sitting in the middle just to make life easy. So suppose I integrate from minus TS over 2 to TS over 2. That avoids having to do anything weird like think about what's happening on the edge if the integral has a impulse response that happens exactly on the edge. The only thing I really need to integrate in that region is this impulse response that's sitting at 0. So I'll write delta T, dt. Well, I'm integrating an impulse. That's like a thing we did back in lecture three. That's easy. This whole thing here is going to give us one. I can easily write that the AK is one over TS. Now this is interesting because all of the Fourier series coefficients are the same. And that's not something that we've seen before. So what does big P J omega look like? Well, let's graph it. How are these things spaced? This is at two pi over TS. This is at four pi over TS. Here I have one at minus 2 pi over TS, and so on, going either direction, dot, 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 dot. And it's an impulse train where the height of each of the impulses is 2 pi over capital TS. So this is fairly remarkable. Up here we have a time domain function. Down here we have its Fourier transform. And they have the same form. They are both impulse trains. Remember back a few lectures ago, we saw that delta functions turned into constants and that constants transformed into delta functions. It would be hard pressed to come up with two functions more conceptually different than a constant and a delta function. But it's fairly rare to find functions where the Fourier transform has the same overall mathematical form as the time domain function. I mean, they're out there, things like Gaussian bell shapes do transform into Gaussian bell shapes, but there's not a lot of these. So that's kind of neat. We've got our basic components. We've got our big X of J omega. We've got our big P of J omega. So let's go ahead and write this all out. I've got two pi big X of J omega, convolving it with this sum. I have two pi over TS, which is what I get from substituting in the AK. I've got delta omega minus k 2 pi over ts. Convolution is linear, so I can pull this big X of j omega into the sum. Convolving with a delta 
corresponds to a shift, and convolution is linear and time invariant, so I can take the convolution with big X of j omega and pull it through the sum. Also, this 2 pi cancels here with this 2 pi. So what I'm left with is a sum of basically copies of my big X of j omega. So I'll write this as omega minus k 2 pi over capital TS. And I do have to remember that there's a 1 over TS sitting out in front here. So to try to plot what big X of S looks like, I need to come up with some concept of what big X of j omega is. Just like we did in the amplitude modulation lecture, let's say this goes from minus omega b to omega b. So it has a highest frequency of omega b. And technically speaking, we really need it to be zero at omega b, but it can actually be doing all sorts of weird things in between there. Here we are assuming that little x of t is real, so we have this conjugate symmetry I'm indicating with this hash mark. In a future lecture, we'll see what some of the consequences are of being able to play with things that are complex valued a little bit. Let's give this a height just to have something. Let me put an A here. Again, it could be going all over the place and be doing all sorts of weird things. It's just nice to have a number to be able to track it with. So if we think about what this guy is doing, basically there's a copy of this big X that's landing at the points of all of these Dirac deltas in the frequency domain. That's what you get when you convolve these functions together. So now trying to plot what big X of j omega looks like, I would wind up with something like this. Let me go ahead and mark the same places on the horizontal axis. So I've got 2 pi over Ts here, 4 pi over Ts here, minus 2 pi over Ts here. And what lands in all of these spots? Well, it's just a copy of this. So I'm going to draw a bunch of triangles here. Here's a triangle, triangle, triangle. I'm trying to make these the same height, not necessarily succeeding. Triangle man, triangle man. All right. Let me keep the hashes, and I'm drawing these non-overlapping. I'll come back to that. So these all have height A, just to have something to call it. But they are all divided by TS, just because the math did that. So taking samples in time, conceptually, corresponds to replicating the Fourier domain representation of the signal. OK, so now suppose I wanted to get my original signal back. I could do that with just an ideal low-pass filter. I'm not trying to plot this to scale, but this low-pass filter would cut off all of these copies up here, so it would kill all these copies. And remember, there's an infinite number of these alias copies going either direction. So I can kill off all of those copies and be left with my original signal that's sitting here. And that's really amazing. As we discussed in previous lectures, it's impossible to actually build a perfect low-pass filter, even in theory, but you could get something reasonably close. To be pedantic about it, in order to really get the original signal back, this low-pass filter needs to have a height of capital TS. It needs to multiply by TS in there in order for the TS here to cancel with the TS that comes from the math down there. That's being fairly pedantic. No real digital to analog process has such a thing in it. Notice that there's a really significant caveat attached to this procedure, which is that these triangles can't overlap. You wind up with this frequency information overlapping, and there's no way to separate it back out. So this is the aliasing situation that we talked about earlier. Actually, to match the notation that we started the lecture with, let me call this omega max. So we'll use this to represent the highest frequency in the signal. Technically, all of the frequencies in the signal are less than omega max. We see that the edge of the triangle, which is at omega max here, needs to be less than pi over Ts. If I want to do this in terms of hertz, I could write Fs times pi over here, and then I could write 2 pi F max to indicate the highest frequency in terms of hertz. So the pi's here will cancel, and I'll wind up with Fs needs to be greater than 2 F max. So this is that Nyquist sampling criterion that we reviewed at the beginning of lecture. So assuming that criterion is satisfied, we can go back up here and put our signal back together. So our reconstruction process includes passing the 
a weird Derek Delta sampled signal through a low-pass filter with height TS and a cutoff at pi over capital TS. So let's call this frequency response big H sub R J omega. And assuming that Nyquist criterion was satisfied, we'll happily get X of T back out of here, which is pretty remarkable. So let's think about what the impulse response of this filter would be. Well, I would have a TS sitting out in front that's from this constant here. And then if I look this up in my Fourier transform table, we had a table that called this something like omega naught. And if we look up in that table, we would have sine whatever that omega naught was, which is here pi over TS times T over pi T. Now, there is kind of an interesting structure here with this TS. So let's divide the numerator and the denominator by TS. So we could write this as sine pi over TS times T all over pi over TS times T. So this is nice because now we have a similar pi over TS structure here. So what would it mean to reconstruct this signal to get our x of t back? Well, we would convolve our weird Dirac sample sequence with our reconstruction filter impulse response. And to remind ourselves of what x of s actually was, let's scroll up a little bit. We see that this x of nts, this is our set of samples, really. So we could write that as x of n in brackets. And then what else am I doing here? Well, I'm taking all of these delta functions and convolving that with our impulse response. So I'll basically be taking this impulse response and shifting it to land at each of these sample points. So with that in mind, let me write this as a sum of x of n, so those are a set of weights, times sine pi over ts times t minus n capital ts all over pi over ts t minus n capital ts because each of these sync functions here has been shifted to land at nts as it's running through the sum. This is called the Nyquist-Shannon reconstruction formula. And it's the recipe for reconstructing a band-limited signal from its samples. And the way this winds up working is that each sync function that you're plunking down winds up having its zeros at the sample points of all the other samples. So the main lobe of that sync function entirely defines what the reconstruction is at a sample point where we do have that original data. And the fact that the side lobes decrease means that in all of the various points in between where all of these sync functions are contributing to fill in the spaces between the samples, the samples that are nearer have greater weight than the samples that are further away. So think about how much of this felt very much like the amplitude modulation work we did. We had some sort of band-limited Fourier transform that we made copies of, either a couple of copies in the case of multiplying by a sinusoid for amplitude modulation, or an infinite number of copies here in talking about sampling. In the AM case, we had to worry about picking a carrier frequency that was big enough so that these Fourier spectra didn't overlap. Here, we need to choose our sample rate so that the spectra don't overlap and scramble the data. And both of these scenarios involved a low-pass filter to reconstruct the original signal. So we used very similar mathematical tools on very different technologies. So you think about sampling as a modern thing that is part of our digital computer age, whereas you think of AM radio, you think of that in terms of the 1930s. So it's remarkable that this kind of theory applies to such a broad set of cases. Now, ultimately, this is all just interesting mathematics. No real reconstruction system works like this. So, just as I did with the AM lecture, now that I've kind of lied to you a little bit about what a real system might do, although I think I was upfront about that, let me show you what an actual real system does. So, part of the vision of this original signal, X sub S of T, is that it was made up of Dirac delta functions. That's not really how a real digital to analog converter work. 
a real analog to digital converter would essentially make these a set of rectangles. It would take the sample value, output that as a voltage or current or whatever, and hold it at a particular value for a while. And then usually what you would do is you would put it through a low-pass filter, but that low-pass filter wouldn't necessarily need to be as steep, as aggressive as the brick wall filter we have here, because all it really needs to do is just smooth out these edges. That said, a lot of the early digital music instruments from the early 1980s would change the pitch of a sound by playing these samples back at different rates. And sometimes they wouldn't necessarily have an actual reconstruction filter. So the sound being played back would have all these sharp transitions. And that was actually kind of part of the sound. So the drum sounds from a Lindrum machine that was, for instance, used by Prince and even used nowadays by a lot of modern producers like Jack Antonoff from Bleachers, who's produced Taylor Swift and Lord, among others. And if you listen to the first Nine Inch Nails album, Pretty Hate Machine, a good portion of the, the grunginess of those sounds is the Emu Emac sampler playing sounds that were pitched way down and had these weird sort of sharp transitions in their waveforms. <laughs> 